good, um, good morning or early afternoon. Good morning. Um, this uh, this uh, session is on cyber future, uh, cyber future of power and state. It's connected somehow to the earlier session, but we will focus on uh, uh, a more um, more diverse uh, perspective. But before we begin, I would like to express my thanks and the entire <coughs> on behalf of the panel too. To the organizers for this um, challenging second strategic uh, debate here, we we have a very distinguished panel that I will introduce very briefly, uh, with apologies for any mispronunciation of names uh, and for uh, any other um, potentially embarrassing uh, references in this context. Um, the the um, I should also say that we have never met each other before, and so this is going to be a very interesting uh, interaction. Um, the the um, panel consists of um, Antonio Lopez, who is um, a politician in Spain and a member of the um, European Parliament, and Secretary General of the European People's Party, and maybe you could put your hand up to know who you are. Um, and then uh, our next speaker, our next um, person I introduce is Nasif Hiti, who is ambassador to the League of Arab States, to Italy and to the Holy See. And that is a, oopsie, a wonderful um, position to be in. Uh, then Mr. Uh, Professor Vitali Namken, and I hope the pronunciation is OK, who is director of, or president of the Institute of Oriental Studies in the Russian Academy of Sciences, and he will do us the great pleasure of speaking in Arabic. Unfortunately, none of us uh, are able to respond in, in his language um, as effectively as he will in ours. Um, and then we have Mr. Um, Doctor, Professor, uh, Maja Lin. I hope that the, the, the pronunciation is, is acceptable to you minimally, who's executive director of Ch China Foundation for International Studies uh, and executive director of the Chinese Academy for the Middle East uh, Studies and director of uh, China Arab Friendship uh, Association. Prof uh, Mr. Uh, Nabil al What Yeah. al CEO of uh, Saudi Aramco Energy uh, Ventures. The gentleman next to me is Professor El Badr El Shadri. Is that okay? Yes, yes, Thank you. <laughs> Who's adjunct professor of uh, at the National Defense College in the UAE. I was told not to spend any time on summarizing the achievement of uh, the panelists, so we will go straight to the, uh, to the issues at hand. i just say a few words about the context within which we will be discussing uh, the challenges uh, uh, this morning. And I'd like to do that uh, simply as a reminder, because I'm sure that you're all, all aware of, uh, uh, of the concerns that uh, that we have here. There are some, some features about the cyber domain with the internet at, at its core uh, that make, um, that create dilemmas for the state and for the state system, and as you've heard this morning, uh, challenges to traditional concepts of, of power. Just want to summarize them for you. It's, it's a, um, I'll summarize, but in a simplified way because um, you, you're familiar with all this. There's the issue of time, the near instantaneity of activities. Then there's the issue of space, the, 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 the cutting across uh, physical constraints with almost no bounds. Then the issue of fluidity, configuration and reconfiguration, which is very effective in political negotiations. Um, then participation, it makes anybody who wants to get involved in a political discourse or anything else can be done uh, very rapidly. In addition to this, there are two extremely vexing, extremely problematic attributes of, of this technology or this, this domain of, uh, of activity. Uh, one of them is attribution. 
very difficult to identify exactly who the individual was that, in, uh, that uh, initiated an activity, a communication, a source. We call that the attribution problem. So it interjects obscurity in, um, in or uncertainty in the debates um, uh, about um, the extent to which the cyber domain can be used for disruptive or for facilitating purposes. And then the last point that I'd like to share with you, because it will come up in the, in the panel, is a matter of accountability. Um, interaction that's using cyber venues in the cyber domain are extremely difficult uh, to be held accountable. <clears throat> and accountability and, and the uses of the instruments of, 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 of the state are somehow um, minimized at this point uh, by this last factor. <clears throat> the very, um, the issue that we don't really understand uh, the full implication of, and it was raised this morning, <clears throat> is that the entire cyber arena was constructed, managed, uh, and organized by the private sector. That we know. But the state system is a very late newcomer as we have demonstrated this morning. So one of the issues that will come up is, well, how will the state-private sector relationship um, change? The um, points that I would like to um, start with is to remind you that here what we're trying to do is to clarify um, our understanding of these new realities, how they can be managed, and how we are beginning to respond uh, to them. So with that, let me just turn to um, a, um, the first question, which I would like to direct to um, Mr. Lopez, to Antonio. Um, the the um, question has been posed this way. Uh, how is the growth and the capabilities and the proliferation of, of, of cyber know-how uh, among nation states affected the power dynamics of um, uh, international relations? You can take it any way you want, extending it from this morning. Um, th there is much to be said about this, and I'd like you to have the first cut into that, please. Thank you very much. As a good politician, I will go a little bit around the question. And I will stop you if you go too far around. <laughs> but I would like to take my opportunity to present myself. And uh, I am a politician, I am European, and I am not an expert in security. So I know that this makes uh, quite a difference in this room today with many of you. You are all experts in uh, security in the United States, in Russia, and many other things, but I represent, I'm a Spanish, but uh, I'm not here as Spanish. I represent my colleagues that come from the United Kingdom, from Bulgaria, from Portugal, and other European countries that we are doing something that goes beyond the nation state, as you put it. So there is a, quite a difference with uh, the title of this uh, of this panel on what we're doing in Europe. I will explain myself. First, I would like to thank Dr. Esteban, thank you very much, and the Emirates Policy Center for this invitation. You're doing an outstanding work here, and especially in the Emirates. I'm proud to be also president of the Friendship Group of the Emirates in the European Parliament. And uh, we are those Europeans that we believe that the crucial role and discussion and debates uh, of the Emirates for us is in the center, at the heart of the region. And uh, we are very happy to be invited and be present in uh, Abu Dhabi these days. Um, by the way, I think it's today or tomorrow is your flag day. It was, if I recall, 1971, when Sheikh Mohammed and Sheikh Rashid and other visionary people thought about the union was better than to be separated. It rings a bell, because this is what we are doing <laughs> in Europe, by the way. Uh, uh, some people, wise people, uh, thought 
like Schumann, Gasperi, and many others, thinkers in the 50s after the World War, thought that united Etihad will be much better than separated. This has been a very difficult process. Many of you are reading the press about the European Union. They all, you always read about crisis. We have, every week we have a different crisis in the European Union. But I have big news for you. The European Union continues. Well, and will continue. Would you allow me to interrupt and ask you to but I will, I, interject I will, on the, the role of, of, of the cyber and communication yes. in the European Union now? Well, I thought I had five minutes to make my presentation like everybody else. <laughs> you stick to the point. But, okay. <laughs> cyber security. Oh, cyber whatever. Whatever. In the European Union, uh, we are 28 member states <coughs> that are trying to get together in this process that I wanted to explain. I don't have the time, I'm sorry for that. We have been, uh, you know that the defense of the liberty of expression, especially for us politicians, freedom of speech, is a cornerstone. We much defend this in the European Parliament. We are great defenders of this. We know that the internet is a powerful tool but difference for many of you that have, you have spoken in the previous panel about defense, security, we also think that the internet is a useful product, like the Arab Spring and many other circumstances have shown us, could be also a perfect way to spread democracy and ideals, if used in a correct way. We have to take into account the two sides of the same coin. We have to be open, we have to know what is the future, and the future is there, you cannot deny it, but also not building firewalls, con massive controls like uh, some uh, other states are doing. Uh, we don't believe in that, massive surveillance. We are taking our steps, we are creating our agencies, our strategy in cybersecurity. We are uh, building over this, but we don't want that it's all about this. We want also the internet to be used by citizens to communicate. Many members of the parliament, I'm sure they are like me, whenever we take now any policy decision, we receive thousands of emails that are, of course, creating and modulating our opinion. And uh, this is essential for us to be in connection. Today, people do not call you by phone from the, our constituencies. They send you emails. We cannot cut that way of communication between politicians and uh, uh, people that have to take decisions uh, with our citizens. That is what we believe. There is a very short line, I know, because <coughs> other people are thinking that they are using these powerful tools for other purposes. I come from a country, yes, I won't mention Spain, where we have, unfortunately, great experience in the question of the fighting against terrorism, both local and international. And I'm telling you, we're taking this account very seriously. In the fight against terrorism, we are by your side. And us in the European Union, we will take the rightful measures to combat this. Sorry about my timing. Thank you for being so gracious about that. Um, can I ask um, um, Nasif Hechi to, 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 to focus on the non-state actors uh, and give us a sense of uh, impacts for the traditional communities in world politics. Uh, thank you, thank you, Madam Chairperson. Uh, I always like to remember and remind of the saying of Albert Holsutter in the past, who said, the facts shall make you free. And I think today the internet made us freer, but in a more chaotic, uh, unpredictable world. Somebody described it in the, privacy, uh, the previous session as a, a neutral device. I would say it's a neutral, of course a neutral, it led to decentralization of power, shifting not entirely, but creating power, empowerment for the non-state actors, for individual. It de if I may use the term, the world more in a way. It democratized information and at the same time carried with the proliferation uh, of, of information. Uh, once, of course, there is control at the, always at the physical level within the nation states, within the states, but once you cross the gate, once you go beyond the gatekeeper, then you're free with the kind of information uh, you could, uh, you could uh, rely and, and, and use. Uh, let me say also that this also could help in two opposing ways. Uh, an integrative process carried particularly 
not exclusively by non-state actors, that could lead to, to a disintegrative process after. Mm -hmm. If you move along, let me say, the trip advisor encouraging tourism, you could also have the terrorist advisor encouraging erecting barriers here and there by the free flow of information, the democratization of information, the terrorist uh, kit that could be used uh, for, uh, for that purpose. Now, I think if you talk about globalization, we are starting to witness uh, a sort of balkanization of that matter. Balkanization of that matter. We know today that there are at least 29 to 30 states which have developed uh, military or intelligence hacking capabilities for what I call the Cold War. Cold War as being a part of a new Cold War in the virtual world against sometimes or using some other times indirectly non-state actors using the same thing. So basically what I would sum up in my first brief intervention allowing me to come after to talk about the future is to say that the non-state actors, the privatization of the internet of this new technique is becoming a key element to deal with and how to establish a balance today or tomorrow between filtering information constraints and the freedom of speech. Well, thank you. This leads us directly to the next question uh, that I'd like to direct uh, with your permission to uh, Dr. Mao Zhao Rin, sorry. Uh, and that is why, why are state policies uh, not, not transparent? Uh, is it because they don't have policies Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> or because we don't know how to ask the questions about their policies? Please. Yes, I, I know. I, you know, uh, international, uh, in internet, uh, we said cyber, uh, this uh, new, uh, new things, you know, it uh, uh, bring uh, uh, us to a new horizon uh, in a, a totally different world. Uh, if we say uh, there's no battery for uh, cyber, but you know, there's a, ba ba there's a border for the countries or the states' uh, interests. And, and just we are the first stage of the Swiss time, I, I think every country, and uh, they, they are in the different um, terms. For example, US, USA is advanced, uh, is, uh, modern China, I, I think uh, modern ten, uh, about 10 years. And then China just follow Americans uh, innovation and the tools and, and the products. Uh, for that, because everything linked with the uh, internet, I think there's uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, critical uh, matter is the security. So in um, different country, I think that the capability of defense or safeguarding interest is different. So I think the policy of uh, uh, um, transparency uh, quite late, not the same. So I think uh, mm -hmm. this, uh, the, the, we, we live in a reality world because uh, this is not only a new world, but this is also uh, an, a new field, a new uh, uh, competitiveness uh, 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 space. So everybody, or every firm, every organization, every country want to keep its uh, interest and uh, to defense any uh, invading uh, aggression uh, from the hikers, from the other, uh, other nations. Uh, for that, I think at the beginning of the internet uh, time, uh, the, the, there is a, there's a gap between the different, uh, between the, the, the uh, internet policies, I think it's acceptable. And then of, of course this problem we can uh, resolve it by, co uh, by coordinating and by cooperation and uh, we can set up the common borders and common red lines and, and the same uh, regulations and uh, even the universal values and to control or manage the, 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 the space world, you know. So implicit in all this is the notion of trust. And uh, to uh, Professor Vitai Nank, and I would like to ask, um, how is all this affecting uh, <coughs> trust between allies, uh, trust between communities that know each other? Is the trust factor affected or relevant here? Shukran jazeelan. ولكن قبل الإجابة على هذا السؤال أريد أن أتوقف عند بعض النقاط الأساسية الهامة قبل كل شيء أن 
دور الفضاء المعلوماتي في العلاقة بين هذه المجموعات التي تمت الإشارة إليها ازداد بشكل كبير لا يضاهيه تطور في أي جانب من الحياة ومن المهم أن الأمن المعلوماتي ينظر إليه كل مجتمع من مجتمعات العالم بأنه ضرورة مهمة بالنسبة لأمنها القومي وهناك طبعا مسؤولية كبيرة تقع على عاتق كل حكومة وتكمن في استعمال الفضاء المعلوماتي بطريقة تتناسب مع مصالحها القومية ومواجهة الهجمات المعلوماتية عليها ومن الملاحظ أن مثل هذه الأساليب المعلوماتية تستعمل في الحروب الحروب المعاصرة وسوف تستعمل بشكل أكبر في الحروب القادمة وكما يقول الأميرال ستافريديس في الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية يتكلم عن الثلاثي الاستراتيجي الجديد قوات خاصة طائرات بدون تيار وسلاح معلوماتي أما روسيا فاقترحت التوقيع على اتفاقية دولية للحد من عسكرة الفضاء المعلوماتي وتنظيمها ولم تجد أذنا صافية وانضمت إلى الدول التي بدأت تشكل قيادات معلوماتية خاصة في قواتها المسلحة وهذا ظاهرة جديدة مهمة جدا بالنسبة للجانب الأمني من هذه المسألة أيضا الملحوظ أن هناك رهاب معلوماتي مهم والواضح أن المنظمات الإرهابية العالمية تصطاد للشباب الموهوبين في المجال المعلوماتي ومثلا بدأت تجند هؤلاء في جمهوريات آسيا الوسطى وفي بعض المناطق الأخرى في الدول العربية طبعا وتجندهم عبر الإنترنت وعبر توزيع الفيديو وإلى آخر وهناك أيضا حروب إعلامية مدام السؤال كان يكمن في الثقة بين المجتمعات وطبعا الدول المختلفة فهناك مع الأسف حروب إعلامية بيننا ونحن في في روسيا نظن أننا نتعرض لمثل هذه الحرب الإعلامية الشديدة في الأونة الأخيرة منها كمثل يعني كثيرا ما نقرا في او نسمع من وكالات الانباء والقنوات التلفزيون كان روسيا ما ما تقصف مثلا داعش في سوريا انما تقصف يعني كل من هو غير داعش وهذا غير صحيح واذا فمثلا البعض يسال لماذا روسيا ما تقصف مثلا رقه وتقصف مثلا الرياض دمشق وحمص والى اخره ولكن اذا قرانا حتى الصحف الاخيره اللي قرأتها المكتوب فيها إنه آيسل ولوكال ريبلز ماي جينز حمص يعني إنه الدعش موجودة في ريف حمص وبدأت تستعمل الأسرة كمثلا دروع إنسانية وهذا شيء فظيع جدا أو في ريف دمشق موجود هذا في في هذه الصحيفة ومن وكالات الأنباء أيضا أن داعش قامت بإعدام مئتين من عناصره وحولوا الانشقاق عنه والانضمام إلى جبهة النصرة معنى هذا أن النصرة وداعش موجودين موجودة في أو موجودتان في ريف دمشق وفي ريف حمص وفي كل هذه كل من هذه المناطق فلماذا روسيا تقصف مثلا الرقة يعني بعد يعني على مسافة بعيدة من هذه المناطق قبل أن يصفيها وثم سوف تأتي إلى هذه المنطقة بالدعم أو مثلا لدعم كل من الجيش السوري ووحدات حماية حماية الشعب الكردية التي سوف سوف يكون معها أيضا خمسين أمريكي و300 بريطاني هذا تراست الحرب الإعلامية هذا هو it is trust I'm speaking about trust. Yeah, I, Informational I war means that there is no trust. And in order to come uh, to establish this good, trust, good, we have to good. get rid of this uh, and to be more objective in uh, discussing things that are dividing us and the, the, what, what is creating problems. And Syria is one of the main problems that is uh, uh, creating distrust among uh, ourselves and among uh, a lot of nations in the world.
Uh, we need this trust. Masbut, so now we go back. If we, if, uh, if we could just finish the, um, um, the, the matter of trust, allow me to, to ask uh, Mr. Lopez one more time uh, to um, highlight any aspect of the impact of, of the internet on trust in the European community. Trust, distrust. Again, I will not talk about cyber wars and about uh, cyber attacks. Trust. I want to talk about trust. We are building in the European Union. I mean, we know that there are a lot of uh, jobs, creation of richness, of wealth behind the cyber world if it's properly driven. Uh, we are now uh, discussing about how this could affect our industry, our future cities, the program of, cyber, of uh, smart cities, mm -hmm. jobs, economy. I mean, please, there are two sides, I said, of the same coin, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that we have to have some trust on this. With a proper control, of course. I'm telling you, I have experience in combating terrorism. Not here, in my country. But I will not turn and I will not allow my country to become a dictatorship in order to combat terrorism. We beat the terrorists in Spain through laws and democracy. It took us years. But we had the trust in the system, in the laws, and also in the internet. We strangled the finance of this terrorist band also through the internet. But without taking away the freedoms and the principles that are built in the European Union, which are freedom of speech and freedom of using the internet. We have to have a balance between both things. That was what I wanted to speak at the beginning. Thank you. Thank you. And just a question of trust. There has been some developments about the US-EU relation, some spying scandals that went on. Uh, the US spying the European Union. No. Well, this, w this went down when the, also we discovered that Germany was also spying the, Uni the United States. But so, isn't spying so a normal case closed, behavior? Case closed, we are even, but this is not the case. Mm -hmm. Trusted allies in the fight also against a common enemy, and I'm talking here in Arab countries that we have this trusted friendship, we have to be all together. And we cannot fail, hmm? even with our Russian friends, even with Chinese and so on, we cannot fail into these kind of traps. And we have to generate the trust to combat our common enemies that are against our principles, that are common in the Arab and also in the European and many other worlds. So in this context then, allow me to, to uh, come back to the context of our hosts here uh, and ask uh, Dr. Badr, the question as to whether the Gulf states um, are among the most at risk because of globalizing access to that form of communication. Well, thank you, Professor. Uh, I'd like to thank the EPC for the invite again for second year, and also especially uh, Professor Ibtisam uh, al for inviting me to uh, participate and be part of this conversation. Now, let me tell you what I think is the impact of cyberspace on the nation state. And then from that, we can understand the vulnerability of the GCC state to the cyberspace or the internet. But it's very important, by the way, in the all discussion, what is missing is sequencing. Now, if the internet were to arrive in the beginning of the nation state, in Europe or United States, maybe they would have looked a little bit different. Now the impact is variable. The cyberspace impact on the industrially as advanced democracies is different than its impact on the developing state. And that's very important fact we should not, should not elude us. So what is the impact of the cyberspace on the developing uh, countries? There are three important impacts. One is structural, second is political, and third is ideological. Now, given the brittleness of state institutions in the developing world, the impact of cyberspace is crucial and very important in many ways. We used to define 
state power as the monopolization of means of violence. So the more it monopolizes means of violence, then the state is very powerful. If it doesn't, then we call it a weak state. Now, given now the weakness of state institution in the developing world, the monopolization of the means of information becomes very important to bolster the legitimacy and uh, uh, the power of the state. So that becomes the sine qua non of development of a state. So you can see now where I'm getting to. Controlling the means of information becomes very important. Now you have opponents and contestants on this space. The second important structural factor on the nation state is the fact that cyberspace and internet speeded up the rate of differentiation within societies without providing a commensurate, a commensurate race of integration. What I mean by that? In the sense that the social component of all developing society, which was artificially united by the state power, came to the fore in the space of the internet because they had the space to organize themselves and augment their sub-national identity at the expense of the national identity. And because the state is weak in the developing world, those integration, the race of integration, took a back burner and the, the race of differentiation. If you go to the Facebook today, you will see those sub-nationals well represented, whether it's tribe, whether it's ethnic, whether it's sect. But you will never see, for example, on Facebook, people calling themselves the children of Mesopotamia, Abna al Rafidain. But you will see a lot of people who are calling themselves children of the Kurds, of the Shia, and the Sunni. And the third point? Okay, I'll move. Now, politically, now, that's the second point. That's the structural. Now, the politically, now, to undermine the regime, any regime, you need the confluences of three rates. But I advise you don't try it at home, okay? <laughs> but I'll tell you. One, you need the mobilization of the masses against the regime. Second, you need <coughs> disgruntled uh, elites to mobilize and do those mobilization. Third, you need the declining repressive capability or capacity of the state for the regime to change. So the internet provides those three elements. Mm -hmm. It provides, it gives voice to the disgruntled and dissatisfied elites. It helps mobilization of the masses, as we saw in the Arab revolt in the past two years. And also, <coughs> it declines or weakens the capacity of the state to repress because of the instantaneous broadcasting of those repression makes the state cherry, cherry and wary about carrying those repression. The final point, and I'll end this, I know you are looking at me, <laughs> is the ideological. Now, if you, can, uh, if you will accept Benedict Anderson that the nation is an imagined community, simply because you don't meet anyone, right? If you are in the United States or in, in even, even in a small country like uh, United Arab Emirates, you don't. What's, what, is, what is collecting the, 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 the nation of United Arab Emirates is a work of imagination, or as Carl Deutsch call, called it, social communication between different, that makes the nation to, to be formed. Now obviously this is, now we have people who are interfering in that imagination. If I imagine my community to be from Khorfa Khan to uh, Ayas Island, another person is, is imagining the community to include all Muslims, all Arabs, all Gulf. So in a sense, this imagination, this ideology of the state becomes a contested train between state functionaries or state power and different individuals who now have or control the means of information equally to the state, and I'll end here. Thank you. So this, this bears clearly on trust, but it also brings us squarely to, to the issue of culture and the cultural identities that are affected. Uh, and perhaps, uh, Nabil, you can uh, comment on that. Uh, and uh, I, you, you will forgive me if I, if I intervene and uh, ask you to continue after we've had another round. No problem. Thank you, Nazla. Uh, actually, I hate reading out off a script, but uh, I was warned that I only had five minutes, so I decided to write my thoughts in a few minutes. Um, actually, taking off from what Al-Badr al-Shitri said, which I strongly agree with, 
uh, the internet will definitely have a major impact on nationalism, on cultural identities in the GCC and elsewhere. But focusing on the GCC, the internet and social media platforms like Twitter, Facebook, and WhatsApp have the potential to threaten the stability of GCC country societies by creating divisions across these societies. However, this can only happen if GCC governments completely ignore the effect of these new technologies and abandon this public space to extremists. And even before we talk about the promise and the danger of the internet and social media platforms, we must first understand and accept that the internet is not an ordinary technological change. It's not like the invention of the car or even the radio and telephone. Yes, these and other technologies of the 19th and 20th centuries had a massive effect on human societies and redefined how we live and where we live. But the internet, like the printing press 500 years ago, will probably reshape our cultures and identities and create new forms of political organization. And, and to this effect, I, I you know, better hinted to that just a little bit a few minutes earlier. In fact, if we really want to understand the internet's potential effect on human history, it can be described as the fourth revolution in human communication. So if the first revolution was language, the second revolution was written language, the third revolution was printing, and finally the fourth revolution is the internet. That is how earth-shaking this technology will be to our world. And it's true that communication technologies have been advancing rapidly over the last 200 years. However, none of these technologies really involve the massive shift in the distribution of information from different, greatly, differing greatly from the printing press. Even radio and TV broadcasting can, can be compared to the printing press. So in the sense that printing millions of papers and sending them to millions of people uh, is not too different from sending a radio and TV message uh, to millions of people uh, through, through the ether. On the other hand, the social media revolution with first internet chat rooms, then later mobile sharing applications like Facebook and WhatsApp is a completely different animal because it essentially means that every individual carries a printing press in their pocket. And just as the printing press reshaped European societies over the last 500 years with the Protestant Reformation, the accumulation of scientific knowledge, and the evolution of national identities, the, these media platforms will invariably have a similar transformative effect on our world. In fact, these changes are, cha these changes are happening today as we speak, even though we don't really see them very, very well at this point. So how should we deal with these changes and how can we harness the social media platforms so that they support the stability of the GCC member countries rather than undermine it? Returning again to the printing press, which was the equivalent of the internet for Europe's renaissance, we know from the extensive scholarship of scholars like Elizabeth Einstein in 19, uh, Eisenstein in, in 1979 with her book, The, Present, the, the Printing Press as an Agent of Change, and Benedict Anderson's Imagined Communities on the rise of nationalism via print capitalism, that printing for profit drove the spread and adoption of printing in Europe. In other words, the owners of printers can be compared to the owners of today's social media platforms like Facebook, YouTube, and WhatsApp. They did not generate content themselves, but set up printers as a platform in the for to al and allowed religious leaders and politicians like Martin Luther and others to print their opinions for a fee. The profitable nature of this business drove its success regardless of what local princes or priests felt. Because if a printer was chased out of one European town, all he had to do was cross the border to another town and start his business there. In that way, neither the Catholic Church nor princes could stop the spread of the printing presses or the ideas that they carried. This phenomena did not happen in China or the Middle East because both regions were dominated for centuries by a single empire and not multiple principalities and city-states like Europe. So even though the movable type of printing press was actually invented in China 1,000 years ago, 500 years before it was used in Europe, the size of the Chinese empire and its strong central government prevented rebel printing presses from printing across the border and then distributing uh, their, their, their revolutionary tracts, let's say, in the urban centers of the Chinese empire. Could, the same applied to the Ottoman could, Empire could, in the Middle East. Excuse me, could, could you just um, re-bring it back, sorry, bring it back, close the loop to now? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, as we said, it was the jagged geography of Europe which created all these small city-states and allowed printers to cross borders. In the same way today, it makes no sense for any government mm -hmm 
to control access to the internet and social media. And therefore, the only way to fight the potentially dangerous content that social media carries into our societies is to fight the bad content with good content. Due to the fact that GCC country citizens are among the most internet-connected populations in the world, uh, in their, they live in the most internet population in the world, however, they live in a relatively controlled non-internet media environment. So they tend to join WhatsApp groups with friends and families, which they trust more than the local official TV newspapers and stations. So the result is that these WhatsApp groups become their main sources of news and opinion. Not only that, but these WhatsApp groups act like echo chambers, with, with the worst prejudices <coughs> being repeated again and again among their members. And this is what, uh, again, Badr, I didn't, we didn't, I, by the way, we didn't agree on this, but Badr <coughs> seems to have kind of uh, work, worked with me indirectly on, and, and uh, vicariously. vicariously, there you go. Uh, essentially, these, the prejudices are echoed within, within these WhatsApp groups, the opinions and the news, and the news is chosen, so you don't go to the local uh, official website, your WhatsApp group members, who you trust, friends, family, tribe, send you the news that they think is important for you to read, and you read that news. And then you form a very prejudiced opinion based on that particular group's opinions. Um, and when you go, but however, if you go to the West, most people who join WhatsApp groups do not join to get their news and opinion. Most join to, to enjoy jokes, share personal news with their friends and family. And so, for example, when Americans want to get news and opinion about current events, they assume that CNN and BBC are, are, are independent, so they go to their websites. They don't ask their WhatsApp group friends, members. So coming back to WhatsApp in the GCC, from a national and cultural identity point of view, these groups can have a devastating effect on the youngest and most vulnerable members of these groups by instilling them a potentially violent, by instilling them a potentially violent hatred for other members of the society. And in this regard, the passing around within these WhatsApp groups of violent videos and extremist audio recordings from the civil wars currently raging around their borders feeds into historical prejudices that would otherwise have been forgotten in the 21st century. And here we're talking about prejudices re relating to Shia, Sunni discord, Kurdish, Arab, Kurdish, Turkish. These should have, should have gone. These, the internet now is going to recreate them and bring them back and maintain them going forward in the future. So, for example, if we take a typical GCC citizen, he or she would have several overlapping identities. The first would be their own national state identity as Saudis or Emiratis. Then they identify as members of a common cultural region that includes the GCC countries versus, let us say, the Egyptian and the Levantine Arabs. This is followed by or includes a pan-Arab or, or, and or pan-Islamic identity and then eventually a humanistic global identity. And these identities are, of course, not fixed but they are likely to shift in importance depending on the messaging that an individual might get at any one moment. And as, as, we, as we said before, it's hopeless for governments to attempt to censor the ideas and messages that their citizens receive. Please, <clears throat> okay. focus, focus. Okay. Um, if you would like me to continue later, I can continue, but if you want me to... What, what I would like, actually, uh, to, if you can wrap up this point where you're at now, Yes. and then we... The, 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 it, it would be good. We have a very long list of potential no interveners. And, I, I, I and no, 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 wait, wait. Minute. And then, as soon as you, 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 you have complete the thought, uh, we can ask the panelists if they'd like to add anything on any topic so far, okay. because I have been a little bit uh, undiplomatic in cutting everyone off, for which I apologize. Thank you. Okay. I saw that. Okay. So, yeah. so, uh, so as we said, it's hopeless <coughs> for governments to, to control this, these, this media. So what to do? Well, to begin with, stop wasting money on the censoring departments and the ministries of information. Mm -hmm. They are today as useless as, ministry, as the Ministry of Astrology for predicting the future. You can't censor the news anymore. Secondly, as UAE Minister of State Anwar Gargash said yesterday, GCC governments need to make some bad, hard decisions today. And among those decisions is deciding who we are as GCC citizens and how we should relate to the world around us in a way that makes life better for us and for the world. Next, we need to make sure that all the messaging coming out of our capitals conforms with this message and that it is conveyed not just via official news outlets, 
but also includes allowing a healthy and open debate in the society about this identity. And finally, citizens should be given a sense of pride and ownership in their country. So for example, the call by Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid for the people of the UAE to nominate names of UAE pioneers who will be recognized on the occasion of the 44th anniversary of UAE National Day is an ideal way to give ordinary citizens a deeper sense of belonging to the country. This pride and sense of belonging then provides a psychological barrier against extremist ideas that might lead an individual to turn against his or her own country. I Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I wonder if any of you have seen the uh, latest Google Maps on uh, which countries <clears throat> control access and for what purposes. Um, of course, the United States is up there as, as well as everybody uh, else, but what's interesting about this is that the purposes for control are really very different. Um, we, we haven't talked about um, uh, control access of pornography, control access of, of et cetera, et cetera, <coughs> or, or <coughs> of blasphemy. And so that aspect, it's not exactly high politics, but it could become. So the impression I have is that there are many diverse perspectives in this panel, um, and there isn't um, a commonality of, of, of views. You, we're touching the elephant from different ways. So can we just go around, and if you wish to add um, an additional comment to what, what you have, or raise any other uh, issue before we get to, to the floor, because the list is really growing. We start from this end. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I, I'll, I'll say something later. I, I prefer to do that. Yeah. But I'll make a comment, and uh, should you have another time to finish on the com or I finish now, <laughs> make my two uh, comments? Very finish. briefly, uh, two I minutes. Think, uh, it's not my choice. We have okay. to decide whether we respond to the community Fine. or whether sure. we take sure. over the time. So just to it, recap. You vote. We don't but, let them okay, vote. Let them ask. <laughs> let them ask <laughs> very uh, very I briefly. Have, I have some words. Well, okay. yeah, we will go need, around. Yeah. You need, yeah, OK. Mm -hmm. Very briefly, two points. First, uh, raised by uh, my eminent uh, colleagues here, we live in a world of multi-layered identity. And with the rise of, and, and not, it's not a specificity of our region, but it could be more in our region because of sociological solidarity, the feeling of belonging to at one layer of identity to the same uh, uh, affiliation. And I think here, the issue, what, what facilitates the role of the messenger, which is the new digital uh, revolutionary uh, technique, is the kind of message that's mostly needed. Uh, when you have sociological solidarity, when you have dissatisfaction, or kind of political dissatisfaction, feeling of marginalization, of exclusion, I have in mind somehow the Arab Spring period, which was labeled at one point of time as a Facebook revolution, as somebody has described today, the new Antifada as a smartphone Antifada. <clears throat> then there is this attractiveness, this need to shape perception or misperception, regardless of where you stand on the issue. So this is a very important matter to take into consideration, the feeling of, which is also crossing the Mediterranean, going into Europe, into that kind of feeling of ex exclusion, seclusion, or whatever, whatever it is. This attractiveness is, is very important in sort of that matter. My second comment, very briefly, for the future, for the future, how to develop first and foremost a code of conduct before being able to reach perhaps a sort of MPT, though the MPT is not an excellent model, it's imperfect, in terms of maintaining a balance between filtering when it's necessary to filter information to attack or counter-attack or contain possibility mm -hmm. of terrorist messages, exclusive messages of exclusion on one hand, and maintaining the freedom and contributing to one layer of identity, which is the global village to which we all belong. Thank you. Can may, we may, <coughs> may I make one very short comment? Uh, so it's, it's rather a question than a comment, but I heard uh, uh, all these uh, you know, presentations, and there is one question for all of us, I think. So we're facing the two main challenges, in my view, for the Arab world. One is identity crisis, and the second is the crisis of the nation state. And it's very important how the cyberspace is addressing these two challenges. Perfect, perfect. Can we go on? Yes, I, I want to have some words uh, about the impact, uh, particularly on the culture. You mentioned that I think the culture is the most important thing for a nation or an ethnic or a, a country because uh, the culture decided that you are Arab country or you are West country or you are Eastern Asia country. For that, I think maybe this, uh, that, that, that some 
can of the reason there is a fire well. For example, uh, for each country, each nation, their traditions, religions, language, even habits and, uh, and clothing, you know. Uh, but the, uh, in the, due, due in the, the, the internet the, the time, the world become one world. But the, the nation, different nations, different ethnic, is uh, still there. Uh, maybe some, some new country, from, uh, for example, America, only more than 200 uh, history, is very short, but China and some uh, Arabic country, they have a long history of more than 4,500 years. So for that, because the, the culture, the Western culture is very strong, and the Eastern culture right now is it's, it's, it's weak, uh, relatively, for that we want to keep our culture around. For example, Right now, the Western country is celebrating Halloween. In China, we also have a festival of ghosts, but uh, so many young citizens, they are celebrating Halloween. You know, uh, Valentine's Day is also popular in China, but China, we also have a the festival, you know. I, I just said two examples, you know. Sir. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you have spoken about nation state and identity crisis. You said very well about the European nations who were capable in the past of uh, producing the printing, which was a revolution. These same states also uh, fight at each other during 800 years. We killed each other. I wanted to speak about the crisis, but I was at that time not given the time because of economical crisis. And in the last two times, we even exported our wars to the rest of the world. In the European Union, we are trying now a little bit, we are not so ambitious, but we are beating this nation state question. Because the globalized world of the future, and I think that we are advancing to which is coming. Of course, we are different. Even in the United Arab Emirates, it's different if you come from Dubai or Abu Dhabi. Yeah, but in the European Union, it might be different if we come from the United Kingdom or from Spain. But we are trying to beat that because the future is going to be you like it or not, in a globalized world. So we have to analyze, and that was also your question, we have to analyze very well because we will be in this globalized world. And we are beating already these notions. And of course, there are some people and citizens that they are lost in this. And we have to guide them through the good news that you spoke about the also internet bad news. We have to guide them through good news. And we have to use also the, 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 the tools that we have in order to establish the new future. Sorry. No, this was perfect. Sir. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, by the way. I just want to restate what I said. I'm not celebrating, I'm not condemning. I'm simply describing what is the reality. The reality is the internet helps strengthening subnational and supranational identities while it's weakening the nation state. This is what I'm saying. Now, this is good or bad, that's a value judgment. I'll leave it to you. But this is a very important, and the state, in this sense, was tried to forge a national identity, and sometimes even artificially to forge national identity, obviously is facing now what is due of long history of trying to make this crucible forcibly uh, melt all those elements in society without giving any autonomy to those societies. Now they have the space to organize. Now they can elude the state. Now they can overcome the power of the state. That simply said is no endorsement. That's a reflection on reality the way I perceive it. I could be wrong, but this is what I think. Nazla, just one, one comment. Yeah, I hate to complicate an already complex subject, but uh, let me throw a, a monkey wrench in the works, as they say in the US. Uh, Technology's advance is not, has not stopped, and it will not stop. Uh, wait 10 years or less, and it will be possible for you to speak to other people in other countries without learning their language. And so an English speaker will be able to take his mobile device, whatever that is, it could be glasses, it could be a watch, it could be a phone. Go to China, not to China initially, maybe to Portugal or to Brazil or Germany, uh, and speaking only English, be able to speak to them as if he was at home speaking to his friends. One person would be hearing, each person would be hearing his own language, being translated instantaneously. 
How is that going to complicate things? 20 years or less, it will be possible to speak even to Chinese or Russians or other farther languages from the uh, Western languages and Arabic. And that will be possible for an Arab tourist to go to China and speak with Chinese villagers and buy fruits from them as if he was buying fruits from his local grocery. Uh, and lest you expect peace to break out just because everybody will be able to talk to everybody, you ha go back to your history and remember that the overwhelming majority of human beings who were killed violently in history were killed by people who spoke their language and usually shared their religion. So w worry about that too. On, on, on this very, very happy note, <laughs> I think um, I'd like to add one small point before we, we turn to the floor, uh, and that is the increased diversity of languages on, on the internet. T 10 years ago, 20 years ago, it was mainly English, and now the, the English is really moving downwards to, I think the last figure I saw was something like 27% or 32%. And Chinese is going up, and this enormous Spanish is going up in a remarkable way. Uh, so we already see the diversification of, of participation on that domain. The, the, um, it, it's time really to, to, to turn to the floor. And uh, our first um, question comes from Nahida Neged. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, my uh, question is for Mr. Isturiz, uh, Lopez Isturiz. Uh, you spoke about um, not wanting to build firewalls and the values of uh, uh, freedom of speech, which many of us here share and respect. Now there are thousands of young Europeans who come to fight in the region with Daesh. Uh, Mr. Barry Pavel in the previous session said that it is not enough anymore to just counter propaganda, to use counter propaganda. There needs to be a strategy. Now we in this region would like to ask you what is the European Union or what can the European Union do to stop this flow of brainwashing that ends up in our region fighting with the most extremist people? Yeah. Uh, first of all, is to put everybody on the same uh, uh, place. We have 28 countries. By the way, we are, have some expertise in the language question because we have 23 languages in Europe. So <laughs> imagine our despair to put everybody together in the internet question, uh, just as a, a small example. Uh, yeah, the European Union is reacting. In 2013, we built our uh, cybersecurity strategy. The European Commission is now working hard in order to obtain also the support uh, from my colleagues and from myself from the European Parliament about this cybersecurity strategy. Uh, as always telling you into account, and in, in this, in the European Parliament, we are very really vigilant in order to have the two sides, as I always said, uh, without losing our, this, our freedoms, uh, which are one of the key, as I said, elements in the European Union, the freedom of movement of people. It's not only the internet, it's also the freedom that we have. Now a citizen from the Emirates can come to, uh, to Europe, whatever country, and can move freely throughout the European Union, once inside, thanks to this freedom of movement, that's also a problem there, because also other people that are not coming for tourism or for cultural reasons or visiting friends, they are coming for other reasons. And there is now also a debate in the European Union, should we close our borders or not, inside? Because no, we are here to build something else. And we have to defend it. And the European Commission, I know they are taking action, and I salute also the efforts of uh, Madame Morgherini and Jean-Claude Juncker in order also to tackle uh, the security question, which for us is fundamental. We have thousands of people, you said it very, very rightly, it's a great, great preoccupation for us uh, in, uh, in some European uh, countries that are going to fight in the, these wrong uh, wars, and uh, we have to take uh, our action as politicians and the responsibility. Thank you. I try to be always the, 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 the next um, intervention question is uh, from uh, Af Afzai um, Khan. Yes, here. Mm -hmm. so. uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, I'm Afzal Khan, 
Uh, I'm a vice chair of security and defense uh, in the European Parliament. Of course, uh, I also happen to come from a city, Manchester, which invented the computer. So, so the whole this genie which is coming out, which we're trying to deal with, it is a taxing subject which we are looking day in, day out. Uh, and what I want to do is really ask the panel uh, if they can maybe shed some light. We know the danger, uh, and we also know that this danger is going to increase. Uh, and it could actually affect individuals, like we've seen recently the Talk Talk company, where the millions of data had been taken. Uh, some of the data can be sensitive, some of it can be also financial side of it. Similarly, you know that when this is abused, uh, whether by an individual or by a country, you can actually do a serious damage to a country. And if you imagine, uh, let's say, something essential as water, you don't actually need to go there physically now. You can be thousands, thousands of miles away and can contaminate the water and hence cause such a huge uh, mess in the whole society. So what is it that we need to be doing so that we can actually have more collaboration so that some of the small countries can actually also uh, use this facility in self as a protection point of view. Uh, so that collaboration, is there uh, something that needs to be done? Thank you. Uh, yes, we're, if we come back to this uh, terrorist uh, networks and websites, you know, they're mostly in English because there are different nationalities uh, living in Europe, in Europe and most of the websites that our young people are reading are in English. But there are also a growing number of we terrorist websites in Russian. It's language number two or number three, I don't remember. Well, of course, Arabic and uh, then uh, English and then Russian. I think it's number three. And uh, in my view, all these strategies that are used against this, uh, you know, attacks are failing. It's a total fail. Nobody can deter this uh, uh, wave of, uh, you know, poisoning, uh, you know, atmosphere raining this cyberspace and these websites. And this is the main uh, way to indoctrinate young people. And it's a disaster. And I think they both, uh, Europeans, Americans, Russians, and the Arab states have to do more about uh, deterring this threat. Can we go on to, to uh, the, the, the next uh, question from uh, Dafer Elani? Shukran Jazeera. ملاحظتي موجهة للمستشرق الكبير والمعروف فيتالي لا شك أن ما يحدث في المنطقة هي حرب طائفية حرب تجري في العراق في سوريا في اليمن وفي غيرها من بؤر التوتر الأخرى حرب طائفية طرفاها إيران من جهة ومن جهة أخرى العرب أنا أعتقد أن التحالف روسيا الأخير مع حكومة طهران إنما هو اصطفاف لصالح فئة ضد فئة أخرى كما وأن قيام موسكو باقتسام الفضاء السوري والتفاهمات حول المجال الكهرومغناطيسي مع إسرائيل إنما أيضا يجرح مشاعرنا كعرب روسيا كانت صديقة للشعوب العربية وأتمنى أن تبقى كذلك أرجو أن يقال لي لمن كانوا أصدقائنا في موسكو إن لم تريدوا أن تبقوا أصدقاء رجاء لا تصطفوا مع أعدائنا شكرا That being a statement and not a question I gather I think it's a very good and provocative question. We're not uh, cooperating with your enemies. And if you are regarding Iran as your main enemy, it's, uh, it's not our question. We, we have, by the way, different agendas with the Iranians. We don't have any religious agenda at all. In my country, we have more than 20 million Muslims who are, all of them, uh, Sunnis. And we believe that they're supporting what Russia is doing there because they have a more acute feeling of threat coming from uh, these terrorist organizations. 
and we came to Syria because we were invited by the legitimate government. Whatever uh, you think about this government, we came uh, invited, and not as our partners who came without invitation. I heard today that uh, Britain is sending 300 troops uh, there to assist uh, protection units, Kurdish protection units. But I think, uh, as it was said here several times, we have to combine our forces to, together against this common enemy. And it's up to, to you to decide what, uh, how can you uh, confront this sectarianism. We have nothing to do with this sectarianism. We're not serving any uh, you know, sect or any uh, confessional group. We believe that we are serving the interests of the Arab world as well, not, our def not also defending, not only defending our national security, because we have thousands of uh, jihadists who came there, uh, about three, a bit less than 3,000 jihadists from Russia and uh, more than 4,000 from Central Asia and the Caucasus. So we are protecting our national security, and we believe that we are protecting also uh, the security of the Arab world. Can we move on to uh, the next uh, question uh, from uh, Azdian Aji? Oh, Aji? Yes. Good day, everybody. Azdian Agil, a researcher from Libya. My question is addressed to Professor Vitali Naumkin. Can you, Professor, give us a general idea about the current tools that are using by Russia to face the growing up of the numerical terrorism. Thank you very much. Of what terrorism? Well, I think what he means. Is Professor Naum Keen, in the general idea of the important tools that are used by Russia today in response to the challenges of the growth of the terrorism of the number? So I've already answered this question about this because that's why. I think maybe, maybe, um, what was meant, and I, I'm not sure, has more to do with um, e economic uh, espionage or digital, digital, not digital, digital. but for, for a different purpose. I mean, not f for the ter but for, for the tools that can be used. Um, do you no, mind very much if we just move on and come back to this later, okay. if need be? It's, it's, no. Um, no, I can explain. Ex so I've already answered a part of this question. So uh, there are several ways, uh, uh, so a lot of tools. It depends on what is the source of this threat. If, it, if you mean the, uh, these terrorist organizations, and uh, that's one thing. If it's uh, something else, it's another thing. As I mentioned, uh, we already, so many states are already establishing special cyber commands within its armed forces. It's one thing. It's related to some, of course, normal competition and uh, un unfortunately, it's, uh, this cyberspace is being militarized. And uh, on the other hand, we are facing this, uh, uh, you know, I, I said poisoning attacks on us from the, from the internet that are indoctrinating these young people who are uh, going uh, subscribed for terrorist attacks and suicide uh, bombers are coming because they are mm -hmm. indoctrinated yeah. by, or recruited by internet, not personally by some people. It's very difficult. It's not, uh, of course, we have to control uh, internet by preventing uh, these websites to be disseminated. So, uh, what we have here is a situation where one more question, and as the management says, that's it, <laughs> this way. So uh, the last question comes from uh, Yusuf uh, Amrani. Amrani. Yes, mm -hmm. thank you very much. I followed with great uh, uh, interest the different interventions. My question goes to Antonio, the Secretary General of the uh, uh, the PPE, and especially about the role of Europe. Don't you think today, due to these difficult challenges? Europe should uh, revisit or reshape its neighborhood policy to be able to meet the expectations of the people of the region and the countries of the region who are embarked in a new relationship. Don't you think we need new tools, a more ambitious policy towards the neighborhood and especially the Mediterranean countries 
which are today facing enormous challenges. We feel that Europe should be more ambitious, should, should, uh, should have more tools to be able to offer political perspectives to the uh, neighborhood countries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, yes, we should do a lot more from Europe. Uh, especially the refugee crisis has shown that uh, we were not up because we didn't have the proper relations as European Union with our neighborhood countries, especially in the Mediterranean. You mentioned the EPP, the European People's Party, to which I belong. I'm Secretary General. Uh, the president of this organization, Joseph Dole, myself, are rightly now devoted to change the philosophy, to introduce, there is also our vice president in the group uh, here, who is in charge all of the Mediterranean relations, uh, Maria Gabriel, so uh, she knows perfectly well about this. We are focusing, you know, about our relation with the MENA countries. Uh, there was a large gap in this sense. Uh, I'm coming from Spain, which is a neighboring country to that of uh, my good friend, Josef Almramni. We finally came to census. The good relation between the government of Spain and the government of Morocco have produced a wonderful now situation in overcoming the refugee crisis in my country. And also, we are doing that for Europe. Uh, we are creating now in DPP a new figure, which is partnership, and we will now open to Mediterranean parties from our good uh, neighbor uh, countries like Algeria, like Morocco, Tunisia, Lebanon. And uh, I think that we have to share more. This is, uh, in, this is very important. There was a school of thinking in the European Union that we should concentrate also ma more further east. Uh, but also there are some of us that we say we have to concentrate in the Mediterranean. And not only attending when something explodes, like in Libya, but to be at the forefront and before the conflict comes, that we could be of help and that we could be reliable partners. Thank you very much. Um, and with that, could you please join me to thank the panels for their um, contribution to this event.